And I heard four steps. On the fourth step, I was looking face to face with this nine foot Sasquatch. My name is William Morris. I go by Bill. Uh, I've been known as uh, also as Mustanger Bill. I used to be a horse trainer in the area for over 20 years, uh, doing natural horsemanship. So I understand the uh, prey and predator kind of mentality of animals. I've trained a lot of different animals from horses to llamas to sheep to cows, believe it or not. <laughs> they were kind of interesting. I'm 59 years old and um, I was never interested in uh, Sasquatch to believe it. Uh, I've never believed in it um, up until I was uh, 17 years old. I'd had a, an encounter when I was 16 uh, from about 35 feet away. And my brain actually told me it was a giant rabbit because it was uh, basically protecting itself. And that memory, believe it or not, didn't unlock until just a few years ago. Uh, but then my next encounter, uh, number two, which was about seven months later, uh, ended up being face to face. And it was something that I just could not deny. Uh, I was less than uh, probably within two feet. Uh, I wouldn't have even had to straighten my arm out to actually touch the creature. So uh, it pretty much uh, solidified my belief in Sasquatch. And uh, I still didn't want much to do with it. I, I had actually a couple more encounters after that, uh, back to back, basically, within a week, week and a half of each other from uh, my second encounter. And I still wanted nothing to do with this subject. As a matter of fact, I didn't even talk about it for 38 years. The first one, you identified it as a giant rabbit, which is a little odd. Yes. Um, the second one, how old were you when the second one happened that was face to face? I was 17. I just turned 17 just a couple months earlier. The one uh, when I was uh, 16 was while I was hunting, and it was all in the same area. It's all in uh, Myrtle Creek, Oregon, in Douglas County, uh, where actually every one of my sightings have happened, and I've had six in total. Well, let's go into detail with those. When you were 17 and you just couldn't deny that what you were looking at was what you were looking at, um, describe the circumstance around that. Well, I'd gotten a little argument with my mother that night, you know, teenage boy, a uh, little power struggle, of course. Uh, so I went to town. I, I lived three and a half miles uh, from town. I lived out on a ranch called the S Diamond Ranch on North Myrtle Road in Myrtle Creek. And um, I, I often walked because I was uh, bodybuilding. I was getting myself in shape. So I always kept myself in shape, even though at the time I actually owned 14 vehicles. I used to buy, sell, fix them up, sell them. And uh, yeah, made a good under to the table living there for a 17 year old. But I'd gone to town, I'd uh, hooked up with some friends on uh, Johnson Street, uh, the apartment building I used to live in called Clearwater Manor. And about 11 o'clock or so, they were ready to go to bed. So it was time to leave. And uh, so the creek runs right behind this place. And I have to cross a bridge and actually I have to cross two bridges to work my way back towards uh, North Myrtle. So I walked across the first bridge and I could actually hear a uh, sound of cavitation in the water like somebody was in the water in the creek below walking up the creek and makes that little air sound that comes in behind your calf. And uh, and plus I smelled something that I'd probably never smelled before. It was like a combination of wet dog, um, skunk, and um, rotten meat, just kind of all combined into one. Very, very kind of disgusting smell, but I just kind of signed it on and walked on down the road. I make a left and I come back up and I cross the creek one more time. I heard the, the cavitation sound again under that bridge, which I thought, well, that was kind of odd. And uh, I didn't really uh, probably smell the smell a little bit, but uh, not not like it was a, going across the first bridge. But there was a market there called Super Y. It's the Y is a spot where um, there's a branch there between Main Street that comes down the road, it crosses past all the schools and everything. Then it branches from if you take a left, you go up North Myrtle. You take a right, you go down South Myrtle. Well, I was coming up from the South Myrtle side. And there's a shortcut behind the store, so I'd take that shortcut. 
because uh, it's kind of dangerous to go up to the Y. You get run over because there's really no place to walk. So I started uh, walking up the road and I got uh, just past the one mile marker. And um, I heard and felt, even though there was a three foot difference between the roadway and down the surface just off the side of the road. And I walked right to the inside edge of the road because uh, it's late at night. I don't want to get run over. Somebody does come through. And I heard uh, and felt four steps. And uh, on the fourth step, I turned to my right and I froze. Uh, I was looking face to face with this uh, about right around a nine foot Sasquatch. And I stood there and stared in his eyes. Uh, his eyes were, everybody calls it eye glow, but I'm telling you, it's, it's not an eye glow. They're actually self illuminating. Um, there was nothing for them to reflect off of. Uh, while I was standing there, I could just barely see his outline. He didn't have the, the high cone-shaped head. It was a, a little cone shape to it, but nothing nothing major. And uh, it was dark enough that I just pretty much see a silhouette, but all I was fixated on was those glowing green eyes. And this lasted for about two minutes. He turned, I heard him take three steps, and he was gone. So I started walking backwards. <laughs> with my eyes fixed on the spot where it was or where it happened. And then I started jogging backwards and turn and probably ran the fastest mile anybody could run back to town to that uh, market, the super white market, which was lined with brick around it. And I was right dead center of it, but there was a phone booth right there and there was only two in town. And what we used to do is uh, if we didn't have change or anything, we'd call home and we would just click on the, a receiver there and it would make clicks on the phone on the other side is which kind of acted as a signal hey come pick me up um so my mom came to town and got me and uh she uh noted that uh if you ask her that uh i was white uh about as white as a sheet of paper easily and uh, she says bill's not white and so she knew i was scared to death and she knew i was a uh, pretty fearless kind of guy because like i said i was bodybuilding i was a big guy I'm still a big guy, just older, <laughs> not quite as in good a shape. But uh, yeah, as uh, she started home, as soon as we got close to the spot, I'm like, step on it, please. And then I started telling her the story of everything that happened. And uh, wasn't sure if she believed me or not, but she seemed to. And uh, my mom was pretty receptive to things like that, like me. I'm uh, always been very open-minded. Even when I was growing up, I was very open-minded. That yeah. was my second encounter. Right. Um, but you've had six total. I've had six total. Were they all during that time frame when you were younger? Uh, four of them were right in that time frame. The first one was right behind our home where we were there on the S Diamond Ranch. We're in a mobile that was on a rise up on a hill and the bank was cut back to be able to put that in there. And that uh, the first one happened just over the, the rise of the hill, which was only. Oh, 75 yards from where I lived. And I was actually hunting and I came down and I have to go through a little gate there. They, they, they were putting in a road at one time, then they stopped it. So there was uh between the trailer, I have to go up a cut bank and climb up above, but there's a roadway that goes on to the other part of the property. This was uh, well over 500 acres, this, this property. So there was plenty of room to hunt on and it was a nice little valley, but I was hunting on the road side of it because uh, the property just on the other side, which was still part of the property, um, always had deer at night, always, but um, this was daytime. So I just came up, I have to go through a little gate that they had locked there, and uh, which stopped where the road was and walked down probably 50, 75 feet. And I saw a little movement to my left. And as when you're hunting, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the deer they always wiggle their ears because the bugs and you know they, they just can't help themselves there there's going to be movement so really not as hard to find as you think they are and um i looked over at this and and i never raised my gun or anything because i just didn't know what i was seeing to me it looked like a giant rabbit like a rabbit at rest with its its legs down and its arms bent along its side but it had its head down so i couldn't see its head but it was like tricolored it was uh, black with uh, brown and red splotches mixed in between through his coat. And I've had a, actually had a rabbit that had the same type of coat. 
So that's probably why my mind went to that at that time that I saw a rabbit. But uh, after about me being there for about two minutes of looking at this thing, trying to figure out what the heck I was looking at, it dove into the brush. And uh, when it did that, it put its hands, and that's the one thing I remember is it had hands and long arms. And it drove into the brush, and I never heard another sound after that. I didn't hear it uh, leaving, escaping, anything. And this is uh, in October, and it was pretty dry that year, I remember, because walking through the woods, it's like you're walking on potato chips. That was part of the reason I was walking out into the grassy area down the little roadway that uh, went along there to just kind of sneak along and look at the tree line and see what I could find. But yeah, um, that was in October of 1980. Then the second one that I just described face-to-face uh, -face was in around um, just the very end of May to like the first week of June in 1981, and I was 17. Yeah, what are the other encounters? Then the other ones happened within, um, one happened within probably about a week and a half of the face-to-face, of the -face, and the other one about a week later. Uh, the third one, I felt it's that feeling that something's watching you. And I was I was just going to bed. My mom was at the other end of the place. We were in a, a mobile home. I had the family room because uh, I was a musician. I used to have my band up, so I needed a big room. I had piano, everything in there. So it was great for a teenager because uh, I had lots of space. I loved it. And uh, she was at the other end, so probably at least 50 feet away. I had gotten that feeling where the, the hair raises up on the back of your neck and your all your hair is actually in your whole body raise up and you feel something's just watching you. So I went to my back window that faced the hill, the cut bank, um, and I looked out and the first set of trees on top of the hill there, which was only about 30 feet away, I saw those green glowing eyes again. And it was squatted down next to a tree, that the first tree set of trees that were there. And I closed the curtains real quick, ran and jumped in bed and kind of curled up in the fetal position because uh, I was just scared. I, all I could do is lay there and say, oh, just please don't kill us. You know, don't kill me. Don't don't no, don't hurt me. You know, and uh, and my mom uh, felt the same thing. She couldn't move. Uh, she just actually relayed this to me here just uh probably about two months ago that uh, she was actually could not move the entire night. Um, she was frozen in bed, felt like she was paralyzed and uh, that kind of terrified her. But this, And she felt that uh, she was being watched as well. So next morning when that feeling, feeling started subsiding uh, just before dawn, uh, she'd gotten up and headed into the kitchen and I kind of ran into the kitchen and says, well, how'd you sleep? She says, oh, I didn't sleep at all. That's when I told her, what would happen for the night is that uh, we had a visitor out behind the house and sat there all night long. But one thing I haven't said in, in uh, some of my other interviews is I went up to the same spot about three days later because the ranch I was on was actually a working sheep ranch. And uh, there was actually a sheep there and its head had been torn off and was nowhere to be found. Just the rest of the body had been left behind. Well, that's one thing I do remember. It was really solid. Then the uh, next one was about a week later, and my mom was witness to it as well. She was, uh, we were standing uh, in our driveway. Uh, the sun had just got down below, just got below the mountain, and um, still plenty of light. You know, it's very, very light out. And uh, she noticed, I believe she noticed first, uh, we're kind of up there just having a conversation. She looked off across the valley there, and... Um, just as you could see something come into view of something that was walking down there, there she spotted the glowing eyes, the, the green glowing eyes that looked directly at us. And it was just inside the tree line from the pasture that's across the road. So I put it at right around a quarter mile, maybe a little less, uh, under a quarter mile, which is actually the end of the, this property to where it crosses the road. There's a tree line that runs all the way around and around the first pasture, then there's forest, then the creek, and then the mountain on the other side. Uh, we watched this thing just glide through the, the forest there. And about every five or six steps, it, it would turn itself and look at us. So it knew we were watching it, and it looked directly at us. And uh, this thing made it from 
low section all the way to the top of the mountain in just a couple minutes. Um, I was in great shape and it would have taken me a minimum of a half hour to get up to the top of that mountain. And that's running full speed and not running. Uh, that would be like running on a road, not running through all kinds of uh, deadfalls or anything else. That uh, This thing was just seeming to glide right through the forest. Um, it had no problem uh, traversing everything. But I, I got a feeling, though, when it uh, when it was doing this and leaving that it was uh, kind of telling me goodbye. So, and that's one thing that kind of stuck with me. I thought, well, that's very strange. Why would I feel that? So, uh, it crested the top of the hill. And uh, like I said, my mom was witness to it. Uh, she's 81 years or yeah, 80 years old right now. I'm getting ready to go on 81, but she still remembers it uh, like it was yesterday. That was my fourth encounter. I had all those, they were all pretty close back to back uh, between 16 and 17 years old. Then I pretty much uh, filed everything away for uh, 38 years. I watched all the shows, Finding Bigfoot and all that stuff. So there was an opportunity over in Bend, Oregon. Um, there was a Squatch and Bruise. So you uh, go uh, listen to Cliff Barrickman was there. Um, oh, Mark Marcel was there. Matter of fact, Mark is the first person other than my mother that uh, I ever told any of my stories about, in which I told him about the face to face, and that's that's the one that terrified me the most. And I kept all that inside for 38 years, so it was quite liberating to be able to tell somebody that's not going to look at you like a deer in the headlights that understood what was going on. Mark and I were standing at the curb. I didn't know who he was. I just thought he was somebody there for the conference. So, you know, I didn't know any of them except for Cliff uh, Barrickman from Finding Bigfoot just because of the show. And I had chatted with uh, Cliff a few times and uh, James Fay as well. Uh, they were doing some things over here at the coast and I was hoping to go, but I told him, I was telling him about some of my stories of what happened to me. And uh, so Cliff knew when he walked in that, uh, you know, who I was, because he called me by name uh, when he came into the conference. It wasn't really a conference. It was just basically a get together. Um, but Mark Marcel is the first person I talked to. We were out on the curb and uh, and I told him about my face to face and he found it pretty darn interesting. Then the next person uh, was uh, Ken Gerhard. So each each person that I talked to, it, it just kind of lifted me a little little lighter for keeping that secret for so long. And uh, Ken was very understanding. Uh, he's he's kind of like my little brother now. Uh, we talk often, uh, but right now he's just been pretty busy, so I've been leaving him alone. He's uh, doing a lot of traveling, a lot of conferences. Uh, and uh, then the next person was a gentleman by the name of Randy Sylvie. He's in uh, the Ben Bigfoot Research Group. And uh, I blame Randy for a lot of it, <laughs> of what I'm doing now. But... Uh, he was very, very accommodating, very good guy, very big hearted and uh, was very willing to listen to uh, what had happened to me. Then the next person uh, I talked to was uh, Cliff Barrickman. And uh, the rest is history. From that point on, um, I, I was interested in um, maybe, you know, starting to go, OK, well, I feel such a relief of getting all this off my shoulders after 38 years. Um, that, you know, I would start uh, maybe researching the subject a little bit. Um, somebody had posted on a line, it was probably oh, less than a year after, uh, actually, I think it was the same year the Squatch and Bruise happened, uh, about uh, somebody, uh, an author that was looking for people with face-to-face uh, -face encounters. And uh, so I responded to it, and... Um, in my story in and uh ended up in his book <laughs> he said well if it's good enough i'll bump somebody <laughs> as a joke but but i ended up in his book anyhow and um i just got to starting to collecting books on sasquatch and reading about them and just kind of throwing out things that kind of insulted my intelligence um of because everybody's banging on trees and the thing of it is is as i hear them doing these things in the call blasting that uh the Sasquatches seem to get further and further away. You know, they, they'll kind of respond to them, but uh, they uh, never did get a sighting. You know, and there's uh, it's amazing that uh, 
people that we call the four horsemen of Sasquatch, that uh, all of them believed in it all the way up to their death, except there's only one still living, and that's Peter Byrne. Uh, he lives over here in Oceanside, uh, or Ocean City, over on the Oregon coast here. And uh, none of them ever saw Sasquatch, but they believed in it till, you know, their dying breath. So I found that very interesting that uh, they had seen enough evidence to, without ever seeing the creature, to absolutely decide it was real. Were there was there evidence, footprints, wood structures, any uh, any of that sort of thing that you remember? No, there's absolutely nothing that I remember. I didn't know anything about uh, structures or anything of the kind then, and. Um, I learned a lot of that from just watching Finding Bigfoot and some of these other shows, because even even through a lot of the books that I've read and everything, they, they never mentioned anything about wood structures. So I, I had no idea what they were. Then Finding Bigfoot kind of put a few things out there on, on tree structures and and talking about vocalizations and their whoops and uh, what they call tree knocking. But I think a lot of I think people have kind of dispelled that a little bit because some people have seen them it's actually done with their mouth that they're not actually banging a stick on a tree but it sure sounds like it and um but my fist sighting what i decided was uh, the book that i'm in is uh sasquatch face to face by tom cantrell and i was actually watching a uh what really got me started and got me to start researching excuse me was uh, Tom Cantrell. I was watching a, a, a show that he was on and they were doing an interview with him and he had said something about um, that they mentally connect with you and that that connection could last for life. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, I think I might want to try a little hypothesis on this to see if it actually works. Uh, basically, I wanted to call BS on it. <laughs> this is what I actually set out to do. And uh, so I spent an entire week before I decided I was going to go of thinking day and night, every waking moment about the sightings that I'd had, especially uh, the one that I was face to face with, uh, that I wanted to see him specifically and would think about the area I was going to go to. And in the area that I was going to do this in is a place that I've hunted and I've been going to for close to 40 years. I know every inch of the mountain. I've walked every inch of the mountain. And uh, most people are, are what we call road hunters here. Uh, they just hunt from the road. Most of it's illegal the way they shoot a deer because you're not allowed to shoot them from a roadway. But uh, I, you rarely ever see one get out of their vehicle, uh, which uh, I'm out in the woods. And when I see them coming, I usually uh, just lay down and hide like a Sasquatch, basically, because I'm afraid, uh, well, I'm going to get shot because I... Uh, been a lot of time following their beer cans around the woods and that kind of bothered me a lot so but i've gotten several deer out of this place and that's why i usually go there but i had thought about this for for an entire week and i, I decided i was really adamant about doing this and see if i could actually connect with the sasquatch if uh if I, there was actually anything to you know having a connection with them uh, and so i started my way up there and uh, it's only about 45 minutes from where I live now. It was actually further away when I lived in Canyonville, um, which uh, you would, if you looked at a map, you'd think Canyonville was closer, but actually Medford's closer. So that uh, uh, made it real easy. It's a 45 minute drive over. And uh, on my way up, uh, I make a turn onto a different highway. And um, I get this message in my head and now I know it is mind speak, or it's basically telepathy is what it is. And I get a message basically saying, uh, we're not going to meet you where you wanted to meet. And uh, I, <laughs> I kind of looked around and I had no idea what just happened. <laughs> I'm like, am I hearing things? Am I going crazy? What's this all about? But I'm open-minded. So I'm, I'm one of these people who go, oh, okay, that was interesting. And, uh, hmm, uh, We'll see what happens here. So I headed on up to the area and I turned off onto the dirt road. It goes in the, the area I wanted to be. And there was a gentleman there. Uh, I thought he was lost. So I saw and had a conversation with him for a little bit. And uh, I went up the road 
and he was uh, not too far behind me. But I went as far as I could go. I hit uh, about a three foot deep bank of snow. So that was pretty much the end of where I was headed. And then that little thought that popped in my head or whatever it was, the mind speaker, or however you want to uh, perceive it as, um, that we're not going to meet you where you wanted to meet. So I turn around and come back down. There's a little area there that I call the triangle marsh because it, it is shaped like a triangle. And by the time I turn around and come back down, the, the other gentleman I'd been talking to come up behind me. And I was like, oh, you don't want to go up there. There's You can't go very far. Another 150 yards, you're going to be turning around, coming back down. Yes, okay, so we talked a little bit, and uh, he left, or while we were conversing, there was another truck that went flying by us up there, and we were both laughing. Is it? About 30 seconds later, he's turned around and coming back down. Uh, but he uh, he left, and uh, I uh, Tom also has a thing he calls armchair squatching. And another thing I was going to try to call BS on. So I go down into the through the tree line and everything. Find me a spot where I could look out over over the area of the, the Triangle Marsh. And I'm like, well, this is kind of interesting. I, I brought a book with me. I brought some lunch, and I found a um, tree root that come up a nice nice little bench that was perfect for sitting on and relaxing. And and just I could see everything out there as far as the vision of the marsh area went. And uh, but I thought in my mind, okay, well, let's test this connection. And it was like, uh, if you're here, give me a tree knock. And it wasn't a couple seconds later, almost instant, that I heard a tree knock. It came from, uh, I'd say probably about a quarter mile away to the um, southwest. And uh, that really surprised me. I was like, well, <laughs> it could be a tree creaking. Uh, it could be an anomaly. So about... Uh, Probably 10, 15 minutes later, I was sitting there and uh, I heard a whistle come from the same direction the tree knock came from, but it was very close. And then I heard another one directly west of me. Then I heard another one directly behind me on the hill behind me. So, and I didn't know about them whistling like that or anything. And I was like, well, this is no bird I ever heard. And I got up to stretch a little bit and I looked over and I, I see something in my field of vision between the bushes where I knew there's nothing there, there's no bush or anything there, but it looked like a bush there. Um, it's kind of a silvery gray and it would just, just look like a, a mound of bush. And what it was is he had his head down, he had his knuckles down in front of him and he was kind of sitting on his heels and just sat there. And I had to look at it three different times to realize that uh, it was the Sasquatch that uh, he actually was there and which just i uh, i was like wow <laughs> uh mom was right this actually works you do actually get a connection with them and uh i was just experimenting and it worked the first time out then about uh probably about 10 minutes later i heard three super fast what we'd call knocks um directly to the right of me which was uh to the west and they were like machine gun they were so fast and i should have been able to see whatever did it because i mean it was it sounded like it was 50 feet away from me which would have been just inside the tree line which i could actually see into um which was kind of a surprise uh so the next time i got up the stretch and part of part of the whole thing of uh it, what I was doing was ignoring that the other Sasquatch was there. And I've been told that if the more you ignore them, the longer they'll stay around. So I was like, well, okay, I'm going to try that too. And so I'd just get up every couple minutes and stretch because I do have a, a bad back. And uh, I'd look over and see that he's still there. So I'd gotten up after the I heard those tree knocks and looked over and Juvenile was standing right next to the alpha male the alpha male, even though he was down on his heels, he was still taller than the juvenile. The juvenile was about five foot tall. And it was just standing next to him, just uh, doing a little bit of a rock back and forth and just looking at me. And so I just sat back down, started to read my book again. And I uh, just get up every few minutes and, and look and see if they're still there. And they're still there. I was like, wow, he's uh, introduced me to a juvenile. Well, that just felt kind of odd or but kind of honor 
like an honor, you know, it was like, here, here's one of my kids. <laughs> so, um, I was pretty amazed at that. And the whole encounter lasted about 45 minutes. And, um, finally got up and they were they were gone i didn't see them leave physically so i was like okay well that's over with so i know the juvenile came from directly the west which means he would have had been on the road coming down a road um so i walked up there and i actually found uh, some of his footprints his footprints were uh in the snow they were nine and a half inches uh by uh about three and a half inches at the time. There was 32 inches between the first uh, and the second step and the second to third was uh, 34 inches. And uh, I was like, well, this actually did happen. It wasn't my imagination. I have a little bit of physical proof. So when I got back to town, I actually uh, sent a picture of uh, one of the prints to Randy Silvey. And he had one of his group members that was actually visiting family in Grants Pass. We were going to try to hook up and she was going to go up there with me and uh you know document everything but unfortunately she got too busy with the family and everything that she was doing uh she wasn't able to come so last minute i drove to uh lowe's got a 25 pound bag of hydrocal and headed right back up there but that day it was 72 degrees and a lot of the most everything with any kind of definition had melted out uh the prints that i found of the juvenile in the snow um one was completely melted out and the other two were just so melted that it wouldn't have been worth even trying to cast. So that was that day. <laughs> and that's when I started my research. From that day on, I started going up there and I started discovering tree structures. And they were all fresh. I have pictures of them when they first happened because they were still green trees at the time. Now they're, now they're fairly dry. It's been two and a half years since most of the structures were there. I found uh, what they call asterisks. I found um, a lot of the teepee structures. The asterisks, I actually have. Most people, from what I see, they find maybe one, two asterisks in an area. I've actually got about seven. Um, several teepee structures, lots of broken branches and trees. Matter of fact, uh, I met uh, James Fay last year. Global Fay, I was with another researcher over in Bannon, Oregon. Uh, they're working on a, a project together and uh one of the tree breaks from the area you could just absolutely see the twist and everything in it in the snap and i gifted that to uh bobo and uh he just absolutely loved it and it was my favorite one i, I hated to part with it but for some reason i felt i needed to give it to it but i have more <laughs> i have several put away actually i try not to take too many things there um, i try not to disturb their structures because I don't want them upset with me. I don't know how they feel about it. But uh, don't do much other than take photographs. Have you tried any more of the mind speak with them since that time? Um, the only one I seem to be able to do that with is the alpha male. And I haven't seen him since that day. I know he's there, you know, but he's 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 the one just watching out for everybody when, when the others are around. Um, you know, acting, uh, um, assuming would be acting as the protector, you know, just to keep an eye on things and make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do something crazy because I am armed when I'm up there. And I've explained to them verbally, because uh, when I go up there, you, you'd think I was crazy if you found me in the woods because I'm out there talking out loud to them, um, explaining different things I'm doing. Um, and I have explained to them that I am armed, but it's not for them. Because uh, it would probably just make him angry if I, if I shot him and they'd shred me to pieces. Because if you uh, only understood how big they are and the muscle mass they are. I mean, the, my alpha male, I call him silver because after all these years, he's, he's turned silver. About three quarters of his hair down is silver at the ends. Then the last quarter close to his body is uh, black still. And... Uh, He's about four feet across at the shoulders and probably at least three foot deep in his chest. He's just absolutely massive and built like the, oh, there's not a bodybuilder on the planet that's ever even come close to looking like him. They have just like muscle on top of muscle and it's just an amazing thing to see. But the whole thing was, is, you know, I'd lost my fear. You know, once I got to talking about, uh, Sasquatch to other people like Mark Marcel and, and Cliff and um, 
I'd actually heard on something, and it was something that stuck in my mind that uh, somebody had said, well, they never tried to hurt me. And I thought about that statement for the longest time because I'm kind of OCD. So I get stuck on a little statement or something like that and I'll overthink it a thousand times. And, and, you know, it's uh, just something that struck me is like, yeah, you know, that they never did try to hurt me. I, I, I don't think they're very aggressive, you know, unless you did something extremely wrong or hurt one of the family members. Uh, I think they're actually uh, pretty passive. And that's something that I'm working on and trying to spell that, that that they're not monsters. So the next sighting I had was last September. Well, the the fifth sighting that I just talked about uh, at the Triangle Marsh was uh, March 27th of uh, 2021. So I got real excited about everything from that point on. It's like, well, I'm actually was able to bring them out and bring them to me and do actually bring them to me, you know, by doing what uh, Tom always called armchair squatching, which is take a lunch, relax, find you a spot, read a book, just kick back and let them come to you because they know you're there. Uh, I think even before you even step into the woods, they know you're coming. Um, I think they have full access to your thoughts. So I think it's a, a vibrational type of thing. And um, it's just very odd, very strange. A lot of strange things happen around them that I, I can't explain. But I just, uh, I call Tom often. He's just always telling me, go with it. Whatever it is, just go with it. And I do. I just try to keep my mind open. But the next sighting I had was last September. And that was September 13th, which I actually uh, took two photos. And I thought the juvenile had taken off, but uh, examining my photos here not too long ago, I really blew them up and looked at them. They're, they're not the greatest because they were taken on a cell phone. Uh, from 68 feet away so i don't have that detail so i actually um, sent them to uh scott violet from uh, squatch america uh because he had one of his enhanced to a friend of his and uh he's going to send mine out to him to see what they can do with it and see if they can bring out more detail but i thought the juvenile had taken off when i mentioned taking a photo and um but actually he was right next to his mother and leaning out from her uh back so I have a picture of both of them. It's just uh, hard to see. Like I said, it was done on a, a cell phone camera and mine is probably like 0.3 megapixels. So you can't really blow it up. I had actually ordered a new camera, which I have now as a 4K and it takes a 30 megapixel, megapixel shot. And, uh, but it arrived two days after this incident happened. But the strange thing leading up to this was for a couple months previous to it, because um, when, when I get out to my my area there and, and look around, there's a little uh, spring that I go to. And I always say, Bill's here. Uh, real loud, you know, just because, I mean, I know they know I'm here, but just to announce myself. And for about two months before I actually saw, this is the, the, the alpha female, um, I would hear my name called. I would just be opening my door at some spot. I was stopping to check something out. And I would hear my name being called uh, in a very, very lady librarian kind of voice. Very, very proper, but very ladylike voice. And uh, I just, <laughs> maybe it's, I know I'm the only one out here. Uh, maybe I'm going a little nuts. I don't know. Um, but uh, that happened several times until I was up in one area close to, there's a very large trident. Or not a, uh, an asterisk. Not a trident. Um, that I imagine was done by you know the alpha male because uh, they were very big logs. It's not something uh, it would have taken uh, a lot of strength to put this thing together. And uh, I was probably just only probably four or five hundred yards from that. It's up around a couple more corners of the road I was in. But there's a spot in the road that I'd been noticing. Um, that had kind of a pyramid, a little trail that went up one side, one that went up the other side and it met at the top and you could see where there had been lots of activity going through there. And uh, I had read a few things about saying, well, Sasquatches do like us because they can't walk straight up that hill, um, that they do a, like a side hill walk where you just turn your foot sideways. And what happens when that happens, if the soil will give down below you, it gives you a flatter spot. So you have a better grip. 
uh, when you're going up the hills. Uh, I've, I've done it many times as a hunter going up a mountain, uh, tracking a deer or a bear or a cougar. Um, I used to hunt everything. Um, and I'm looking at these spots going, wow, uh, bears don't do that. Nothing else does that. The only thing that does that that I know of is humans. Um, so I was assuming, well, maybe the Sasquatches are doing that. They're doing the side hill walk up there. And as I'm looking at this, this uh, I hear just a loud pop, sound like a tree knock. And it was uh, just on the other side of the road for me, to, which goes just almost straight downhill. And uh, it couldn't have been more than uh, 50, 75 feet away, um, but I didn't see anything. And I hollered out, because I've named the juvenile, this one, um, I've named him JJ. So I call out JJ. And uh, I had brought, actually brought my guitar with me that day because I was going to sit on top of the mountain and do some playing, which I often do. I'm not always looking for Sasquatch or interactions with them. I'm up there just to enjoy myself and enjoy the beauty of things. I like listening to the birds and everything else and the, the wind. And, you know, I just enjoy the nature of it. Uh, sometimes I go up there and I forage. Um, I look for medicinal things as I get my mullen because I have a few lung issues. So I, I go up there and I collect mullen up. Um, there's just so many berries, so much different food and a diversity of trees and wildlife there in this concentrated little area. This is perfect for the Sasquatches. Uh, there's plenty for them to, to feed on. So I went back to my van and, and opened up the back and that allowed them time to actually cross the road from the spot that I took their picture at. Yeah, excuse me. And um, I played my guitar for a while and uh, and I'm talking to them as I'm as I'm playing and, and describing different types of music and because I talk to them like like they're my best friend. Um, just like I would to anybody else. Uh, it's just like, hi, how's your day? You know, it's great. Uh, how's your mom? How's your cousin? You know, just a regular conversation. Um, I've learned to do that, and uh, I've actually had pretty good results. They'll give me these little tree knocks uh, for answers or just let me know they're there. Um, I've had so many different experiences in between things as far as between the sightings that uh, it's just mind-blowing. I've got uh, hundreds of photographs from all the different structures, everything that I've found up there. Um, but I played my guitar for about 45 minutes, and that's when I asked him if I, I actually asked permission to take a photograph, because I'd heard a few other people say, well, you know, I actually got a good photograph of him, but I asked him first. And I thought, well, you know, that makes sense, because I think they're an extremely intelligent being. And I know they understand what I'm saying, and they're able to talk to me in our language. So I asked permission for a photograph, and I actually took two photographs. It was from uh, 68 feet away. I've had time to measure all this and document it. And when I got home, I posted it up and uh, Todd Neese had commented, uh, well, Bill, um, that's pretty cool. Did you take an after shot? And this is where I started learning about evidence <laughs> and uh, proper ways to collect evidence. I've blown a few things, uh, believe me, I've really blown a few things. Uh, like a trackway that I found here just a few months ago. Uh, but I walked away from my computer, jumped in my van, drove a hundred miles round trip to go up there just to take an after shot to show that there was nothing there. And um, came back and posted it and all Todd said was nice. So I was like, oh, thanks for the lesson. <laughs> but uh yeah, I understand why you would want an aftershot to show that there was nothing there, you know, originally and nothing there before, nothing thereafter, you know, to show that there was actually something there when I took those photographs. As they do seem to have some exceptional qualities and um, but they seem somewhat human like as well. What is your opinion of that? Actually, they seem very human like. I just don't think that they think like we do. Um, They've been kind of teaching me different things here and there, and they do it in a different way. They do it by kind of showing you. Uh, well, when I had the, the sighting number five at the Triangle Marsh, one of the questions in my head was, how can you hide in plain sight? And that's exactly what the alpha male showed me there. 
when he had his knuckles to the ground, his head down, his sitting on his heels, he never moved one inch for the entire 45 minutes he was there. So that was his way of answering my question, because if I didn't know what he was and that that was him there, I'd have never known it. I would have walked right past. I probably could have walked within three feet of him and not known that was a Sasquatch, which that right there shows, you know, major intelligence, you know, and for them to be able to do telepathy, to speak to me in my own language, um, there's something that's way beyond there. Um, the, the ones that I have experienced with, um, they look very human-like in the face. Other than the hair and the dark skin, because uh, the juvenile, uh, JJ, and there is actually two juveniles, which I discovered from the snow track, trackway that uh, my son and I found in April. Um, so there's a toddler that I didn't know anything about. Um, but they are the darkest dark, and I could see how if they're back in a tree or back behind a bush, how all it would ever look like is a shadow. I mean, you would never even know they were there. So I imagine uh, they see more of us than we ever see of them. You know, I imagine that we're actually partly their entertainment. But I'm no what I'm noticing a trend right now, though, is um, that they seem to be approaching more and more people. And I think it's mostly people that are very open-minded, that have kind of a little higher vibration than others uh, i mean some will just like the four horsemen um when something chases you what are you going to do you're going to run further away and make sure you don't get caught well the four horsemen there uh basically chased sasquatch all the time uh, so they never actually got to see one you know that was the whole thing and and what made sense to me about letting them come to you and so in testing tom control's theories and stuff i called tom right up right away because when, when I saw the juvenile next to the alpha male, uh, what surprised me is that he was like a stick figure with hair. I mean, real skinny arms, skinny legs, not a real big body. Uh, I was actually expecting them to be a little bulkier and bigger even when they were smaller. But he was actually very thin and very stick figure-like. But he had long hair that hung down from his arms when he had his arm up. It was at least six inches long. And this was just coming out of winter, so I figured, well, that's probably his winter coat. But I didn't expect him to be so skinny. I thought they would be bulkier. So I, I had actually called Tom Cantrell right after uh, and uh, told him about it. He says, no, no, no. He says, I've seen a few juveniles, and that's pretty much the way they are. They, they don't get there until later in life, so... Um, it was just kind of a surprise to me that that was even happening, <laughs> that I even had the encounter. So, but I think they're more human-like as far as looks go. I mean, they're upright. They're bipedal. Um, to be upright and walk like that, it takes a lot of brain power. Um, you know, it just including for us, it takes a lot of brain power. It takes a lot of capacity to be able to do that and to perform all the functions that you need to do automatically. Um, for their communication and, and some of the, as they call, woo factor of things that happen around them, um, I think they've just mastered uh, being part of the environment. Um, I believe they're probably more intelligent than we are as well. You know, this is uh, that's part of why I'm doing my studies, just trying to figure out uh, exactly what they are and and uh, if they are far superior to us. I mean, they're, they're smart enough to stay away from us. Well, that tells me that they're pretty darn smart. You know, I mean, uh, people just, uh, especially in the woods, uh, they'll just shoot anything that moves. So, you know, I, I don't blame them staying away from man. But I think they choose you um, rather than uh, you finding them. Uh, a chance road crossing, that's nothing. I don't think they get a connection with you. But, but when you are in the woods and you actually have a fairly close encounter with them and it lasts for a couple of minutes, I think they do connect to you. And I think you probably have more of a possibility of connecting with them and uh, being able to spend time with them. And the research that you do, you don't really research it other than in the field um, for actually finding Bigfoot. Do you ever do research with other people? I've gone out uh, here just uh, about two months ago with Thomas Potter and his wife um, up at a place uh, near, not too far from Crater Lake. 
Um, I'd actually gone out there because uh, he was having troubles. He still hasn't actually physically seen one. And I thought maybe I could uh, go up and talk to him, hang out with him for a while and chat and find out why. And uh, I think a, a good part of the reason for a lot of folks is because they have that fear because they're still in their mind. You know, I grew up watching monster movies. I watched all the monster shows when I get home from school. I couldn't wait to get home. I, my, my shows are on. Uh, you know, I watched all that stuff. I watched the In Search Ads, all that. Um, because I was just interested in that stuff and just thought, well, it's kind of odd. You know, I don't know if any of it's real, but, but you know, it was just kind of cool. You know, I used to watch The Wolfman, The Mummy, all of those. Um, Frankenstein, uh, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, I wanted to, I never thought any of it was real. You know, I figured it was all made up. But, uh, you know, there's there's always a little grain of truth to anything. And, um uh, yeah, I went up with him. Matter of fact, uh, if, if you went on to my Facebook, you'll see me with a, there is a, um, I'm, I got my foot up a tree, kicking back right next to an asterisk. That was actually found there when I was up with uh, Tom Potter. I found it. Uh, and it was actually so close to his camp, I couldn't believe he couldn't find it. Uh, we were actually pulling out of camp. We were going to go up, because uh, up here we have a, uh, one of the tallest sugar pines in the world and we we're going to go uh, pay it a visit and uh we started pulling out of the camp area and i'm like stop he's like what i said back up i said now look over there he's like what oh i said you see that he said yeah i said it's a giant asterisk i said uh you never noticed that coming in and out of here well well no <laughs> so i found actually several things up there around this area that uh, he hadn't discovered yet uh, just being up there uh, i didn't plan on spending the night up there although i had been invited i was just going to go up for the day and consult with him but i had come home and uh had my dinner and i was going to download the pictures that i had into my computer and i discovered i didn't have my camera or my camera bag uh, i had actually left it in his pickup truck so I drove all the way back up there. I was exhausted. I hadn't slept because I had worked the night before. I worked nights. So I stayed up the entire day without getting any rest and spent it with them, came home, then ended up having to turn around and go back up there. About scared them when I knocked on the door of the little cabin they were they were in, too, and because uh, they were expecting me to come back up. I was like, uh, well, I hate to tell you, I, lost, I, I left my camera in your truck. <laughs> Uh, that's why I'm back up here. So I was so exhausted, I decided I went ahead and stayed the night. So I slept that night, and then the next morning I went out and did a little exploring around the area and, and found a few things. Um, there was He recorded one tree knock, and I said, I know, it happened like 50 feet from me. Um, I said, and there was also a rock thrown, and it was right next to the sugar pine that it was actually a trident. And this thing was at least 200 feet tall. And so this to be formed into a trident had to happen whew, probably 150, 200 years ago. So for, you know, because uh, that is a common uh, sign of Sasquatches is that they do these trees with the tridents that have the three tops coming up. They'll they'll snap things off and where you got three tops coming up. Um, a lot of people don't believe in the tree structures as far as finding them, uh, as far as they figure, oh, it's a bunch of Boy Scout troops out in the woods building things. Well, you know, I was a Boy Scout, too. Matter of fact, I was an Eagle Scout. Um, we built shelters. We built little forts, but nothing like what I see the Sasquatch build. So I know they have a very high intelligence. I, I don't know what these structures mean, but uh, but they're pretty interesting. Uh, um, I would love to understand them. And so maybe in time. You know, they'll reveal to me uh, exactly what they mean or what they're for. But I do know that a lot of this stuff is made in areas where there's um, high energy. Um, the mountain that I'm on, is, it's got water. I don't care how long a drought. We were just came out of a seven-year drought. And water still flows out of this mountain like there's no tomorrow. It's just amazing. I could dig down six inches just about anywhere and hit water. Uh, the food resources, there's elk, there's deer, there's bear, there's cougar, there's uh, coyote, there's uh, just, there's uh, rough grouse, sage grouse, um, blue grouse, um, squirrels, I mean, just everything you can think of, uh, jackrabbits, I've seen it all up there. 
So there, there's no uh, lack of food in the area. Um, there's medicinal plants everywhere. Uh, white willow, you use that for, that's used in aspirin. Uh, Oregon grape, I used to collect up for a pharmaceutical company back when I was like 19, 20 years old. Uh, they use that in laxatives, the, something in the bark that they use for laxatives. Uh, so there's there's just so many things up there uh, as far as medicinal and edibles. But is there anything that you want to end with? I call them sasses and stuff because everybody else does. But actually, uh, usually you call them the forest people. And they are more like people than anything else. Um, don't be afraid of them. Um, I don't think there's anything to really be afraid of. I'm sure there are some places where there are some that are uh, a little mean and obnoxious, but I, I really don't think there's anything to fear. If they're throwing rocks at you or anything like that, it's because you're in an area where maybe they have their, their children and they, they just want you to, to divert, divert you because doing things like that, snapping uh, twigs and, and throwing rocks has uh, kept them safe for many, many years. And but uh, what I would do is I would just back away and apologize to him and leave and come out and try it again later. But I think uh, everybody that is able to connect to him um, can. Uh, they just need to take the time. Just go out there and talk and lose your fear. Number one is lose your fear, because even if you have a small amount of fear, they probably won't present themselves to you. Thank you.